which I'm very excited about. Um, it's called Occupying the Public, and it asks several interconnected questions. And I'm going to read out just a few of them and give you a brief bio of the speakers and the moderator. Um, can we address the idea of the public through a feminist frame? How do we deal with uncertainty in relation to the idea of the public? What happens when practices which engage with this uncertainty? And finally, is there space for play and joy while making their work in public? The panel is moderated by Lakshmi Murthy, with panelists who also focus on their practice, um, Anpu Vaike, Ekta Mittal, and Jasmine Katija. Lakshmi is a contributing editor with Humal South Asian, the region's premier political review magazine published from Colombo. She is the co-founder of the Network of Women in Media in India and the Free Speech Collective. Jasmine is committed to ending violence against women, girls, and all persons, initiated in response to the silence surrounding street harassment in India and globally, Patija found Blank Noise as a student project in 2003. Over the 20 years, Patija has worked with multiple communities and designed a wide range of interventions and methodologies across media to shift public consciousness towards the issue. Anpu Vaike, since 2011, has worked on monumental public art murals across the country abroad. She has curated many street fests from Kochi, Biennale, and more recently, a curated project with support and initiation of Kerala Lalit Kala Academy and the International Theatre Festival of Kerala and Trishu. Ekta co-founded Mara, a media arts collective in Bengaluru in 2008, and has been working in Bengaluru as a practitioner, researcher, curator, and facilitator drawing from intersections of gender, labor, caste, both in rural and urban contexts. She has been making films around labor, migration, and cities since 2009. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I think we'll start with the presentation by Jasmine, um, and then Anpu, and then Ikta, and then finally, uh, Lakshmi will be moderating the panel. OK. OK, sounds good. So we'll start with uh, Lakshmi, who will give a couple of uh, opening remarks. Lakshmi, over to you. Sorry about this last minute change. I just felt I wanted to lay the context a little bit before the presentation. So um, I wanted to just continue from where Deepa left off about the autonomous women's movement of which I've been a part since the early 80s. And uh, one of the main drivers of the movement and campaign was this journey or the connection between personal and political and the push to uh, politicize the personal and inject the political with the personal. And I think a lot of the campaigns, a lot of the questions which were raised even earlier were how, how does one do that and how does one uh, name these things? For example, uh, you know, is there something called feminist filmmaking? Is there something called, uh, you know, feminist journalism or feminist or art, or you know, any of these categories. So that's a question I think that concerns all of us even today, right from you know, the issues onwards. And the push at that time was to make uh, the private public or to make the private visible. Uh, this was to do with campaigns of dowry or rape, marital rape, domestic violence, where a lot of these acts of violence happened in private. And the push was to make them public in a way in which I think now we are rethinking a lot of this because it was to bring in what now is criticized as getting the state into the bedroom, getting the state into our home. And uh, what does that overreach of state control uh, do to us now? And what does privacy really mean when we have uh, you know, such high degree of surveillance such lack of personal data and so on and so forth. I just want to place all of these points so when we talk about the public, we also remember the uh, privilege of privacy that some people crave uh, even today when their lives are so public. 
Uh, I also want to talk about what public means when a lot of women uh, do not have the privilege of privacy. So when we talk about the homeless or we talk about the open defecation, so where then does this push to uh, occupy the public? Uh, we need to, uh, you know, concern ourselves with what kind of balancing act. Uh, this image I just wanted to show as an example of what um, art and activism and the linkages between the two could do. Uh, this was to do with, uh, you know, the exhibition up there is called <coughs> Visible Invisible, and I like to use the term now invisibilized because I don't think very many people are invisible. They have been deliberately invisibilized and silenced. So when we talk about unheard voices, there was a lot of this unheard voices and journalists giving voice and so on. But when we talk about communities that have been deliberately silenced, I think the process is a little different from you know, allowing the voice to be heard and so on. Again, this is just a question I placed over there. So this is a poster from the poster women uh, collection which Sudan did. It's up on our website if any of you would like to see it. It's called poster women. This really symbolizes the journey from silence to midnight. Um, it's an untitled, it's uh, one of the public publishers, which again is typical of a lot of what is produced in the everyday life. <coughs> uh, if we can have uh, image two, please. This was produced probably around 81, 82, and 40 years later, we have this image. This is by an artist called Shaili from Nepal. She's part of a, a process of producing artwork that we are doing to uh, change the narrative of the visual, in particularly in mainstream print media. So when we have, you know, really good articles on rape or domestic violence, which are a product of years and years of intervention and training and so on and so forth. Very often they are uh, accompanied by images which are very typically kind of, uh, very typically, you know, victim uh, images, cowering, uh, hair all over the place, to show an, uh, a violated woman. And not much has changed in the visual field now. You just type in rape and you only get images like that. Where women's mouths are being shot, they're being strangled, they're being trampled upon, and so on. So, this is an image where the uh, mandate was just solidarity. And it was interesting that she did this with, uh, you know, a, a cross generational solidarity, which again was something that was not thought about so much in the early years of the women's movement, nor was intersectional. Nor was, uh, I think, a lot of the uh, concerns which are going on. And we did move from a position of universal sisterhood to where the women and concerns, which might not have been articulated so well in the 80s, they're articulated much better now, but somewhere we might be losing a sense of emotion when we're talking in compartmentalized categories now. Uh, again, very debatable. Uh, so can we have image three? This is an image which I think uh, most of the older people in the room would be familiar with. Uh, this is from 2004, so I think 20 years ago, uh, where uh, this was done by the Mira Paidis, who are the uh, so-called the torch bearers in Manipur, uh, elder women who campaigned against a lot of social issues. And this was a deliberate act of this probing in front of the uh, army headquarters in Nepal, the Assam Rifles, following the rape and murders of a young woman picked up for suspected terrorism. This drew a lot of attention to the uh, issue of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which they were uh, campaigning against for years, but 
nobody practically nobody else in mainland india had even heard of the arms police by joining in the campaign to fight it uh, these this was an almost spontaneous event it was not totally spontaneous it was planned over maybe three or four days and about 13 thousand of those guys Uh, and with this act of disturbing, this again is a very powerful statement where disturbing uh, without consent is an extreme form of violation, which is only now being uh, framed in a criminal law in 2013. But at that time, to uh, you know take control and put in front of uh, the public, this was a very very powerful act of resistance. Uh, I just want to leave you with the last image. Which is of two of the Mira Kaidis also framing themselves the way uh, that they also live their lives. They attend meetings with uh, uh, you know with a whole bunch of people. They talk, they speak, uh, but they also want you know that image to be juxtaposed with this image. So when uh, we, we this is this is about two or three months old. This image where they said, if you ever talk about that. Please show everyone this image that this is also us. So um, I'll just leave you with these images, and I'm sure there'll be a lot to talk about with the presentation. So over to you, Jitin. Thanks, Lakshmi, for that introduction, and also Vaishadi, and thank you, everyone, for being here on a Saturday morning. I'll try not to spoil it. <laughs> um, yeah. So I um, I'm speaking here today as a facilitator, um, as uh, an artist in public service, as I call myself, also as a survivor, and um, I'm just going to read out the first few bits, uh, which is that the bodies we inherit. And uh, grow into from girls to women are occupied and filled with lessons on fear, death, just ways to be prepared, and we grow into bodies shaped by defense. And we are raised to carry this burden of preparedness, and raised to not know, see, or even name the truth. And amidst all of this. Climate amidst this climate is really where our work begins, and really the pursuit is: what does it mean to be shaped by defenselessness? That is the call to action, and that is the commitment as an artist in public service. Also, everything um, that I know is based on listening, um, listening to survivors of violence and to communities, and we also work and strive. To build communities around listening and having the capacity to be listening. Um, so the mind map that you can half see at the moment. Uh, basically, uh, this is really where Blank Nerves began. Um, I was in Srishti at that time. I was um, 23 and brought together all the girl students into this one room and invited them to make a mind map with the word public space. As you can see. Uh, there were largely negative associations, um, which gave the basis to start a conversation. Please come just a moment. Can you sort the slide out? Maybe sure. So out of the 60 in this room, there were about nine who were willing to take this up. Nine who felt ready to take this up, and the idea again was when we have a conversation. If we've had negative experiences in public spaces, what are we talking about? And um, this led to our first nine action sheets, um, and we gathered and we recognized over the next three months of workshops, we recognized that all of us had had inherited some lesson or the other on how to be careful. All of us had inherited lessons on uh, silence. All of us had experiences of 
um, being pubescent and those experiences of, were not of the you know the changing body was not that of pride but that was of shame and um, we questioned this and we questioned our silence we questioned the silence through the university and i graduated <laughs> with an in-house exhibition that was that looming questions on if this is a public issue then how do we um, bring it to the public how you know if there's nobody outside of this issue how do we really work towards making it everybody um and a large part of our work really was around uh, for the next i would say two decades our work really has been around figuring discourse around designing methodologies to trigger discourse for the first decade it was primarily to draw attention to school harassment but uh, in the in the next decade especially after jyoti singh can rape and murder and also questions around it, it really threw up in questions around what is the relationship between the public and the private uh, we call ourselves blank nose is a community of action shiro zero and zero and um Uh, we are a community of action shooters, heroes, and heroes, and we believe that every human being has the ability and potential to be a safe space to offer that safe space, and we invite people to step into that capacity. Um, but after 2012, there were large looming questions at Blank Noise also in terms of how our spaces of violence interconnected. How do we be action shooters everywhere, not just on the street? Um, and uh, and what role does victim blame play? in justifying violence against women and non-binary persons everywhere a large part again just i'll i'll share a few slides from um about uh, you know the methodologies that we designed to address school harassment uh, back then back in 2003 2004 2005 where there was a kind of discomfort in naming what is school harassment and being able to say my threats were being said at Um, so we designed these methodologies where people could just come in and put a thumbprint. And again, street vendors they posted these opinion polls, and they were bilingual. Um, again, after you know, after I graduated, um, I also happened to just start blogging bit by chance, not realizing or recognizing that that's really where the first community was forming itself. And uh, that community comprised bloggers who were journalists, and uh, they became the allies. in taking the uh, message out in in being in championing the call to action um what blank noise has been doing for the past few decades whether school harassment or different aspects of violence that are justified to be contained is really building testimonies of gender based violence and uh designing methodologies on how to build these testimonies and then invite listening and then designing public action so these are our two aspects we really run is around building testimonials and building our capacity to be listeners and the second half is about um designing ideas for possible futures and realities that we believe we the world that our bodies deserve to inhabit again back in um 2004 one of the things that I, you know i went around asking everyone i possibly could and some of you sat in the room also witnessed to that um asking everyone you know do you remember uh, you know asking people to talk to me about their experiences of sexual violence of gender based violence of street harassment back then and i would get a range of responses the climate then you know around street harassment was that it was normalized fear was normalized fear was a given and uh, there were those who did speak to me and there were those who didn't speak to me the ones who didn't speak to me i received answers including how can you ask me such a question it hasn't happened to me i'm not that type of woman and it was confusing then but it took me years to recognize and learn that um that blame and shame play such a role in uh, defining and and allowing us to speak or not speak or to name violence so a large part of our practice really has been about creating space to name violence and to understand violence and to understand shame and then there was a, another group a very small group of people who did speak and when they did speak they would often bring in the clothes they were wearing they would say i was wearing that school uniform and it still happened and i was wearing my sari and it still happened and i started paying attention to that the fact that we remembered what we wore and that it just became a recurring pattern and it led to um from a noticing this and you know establishing that there was a kind of pattern here to how we remembered 
uh, it has become a mission from 2014 onwards, which is called I Never Asked For It, um, where we invite certain individuals, communities to bring that garment we wore when we experienced violence. And that garment is memory, is witness, is voice to that moment. Um, again, our 2004 version of this was really about us recognizing that it was all of us, we all played, it didn't matter. But over the next couple of years and over time, really, and through listening, we really have arrived at this position of um, that we are done pretending. We're not here to show you what we were wearing, but rather to uh, demand listening. Uh, the, the building I never asked for it rests on having a community of listeners. And that, that is an injustice to our survivors to speak if we don't have the capacity to listen. So I never asked for it is about that and the garments become a medium through which uh, we work towards building empathy and, and, and creating a community of listeners. I will also, um, you know, and can, can memory really have a safe place? And what is that safe place for memory are some of the questions that we do deal with. If all of these individual personal memories are all within us and within our bodies, you know, what is it that connects us and how do we create a collective new memory together from moving from a place of having once experienced powerlessness to being in our power together. But it also poses some questions around, you know, what is solidarity? Again, I miss saying this, that the first decade was really about being built by citizens who have stepped in to say, I'm going to be an action shiro and I want to do something about it. But the next decade was very critically looking inwards and saying who is yet to be heard. And um, if this is something that affects all of us, um, how do we work together beyond as members of the public, but also as feminist allies? And what is feminist solidarity? And in terms of my uh, privilege and my location, it, it is different from the communities that I may have engaged with, and I carry a privilege. But um, at the same time, what is that shared common ground? And what is it that we can build together? So really, as an artist, I'm designing ideas for collective action. And I'm um, designing ideas that I'm taking from one community to the next and saying, does this speak to you? Uh, you in your, I was recently in touch. And again, I was in this room. Um, and, we, and I shared this project. And again, there was a deep resonance. I saw a lot of eyes that were full and less conversation. But it was the start of, it felt like the start of something that this speaks to me and how do we make it our own is really the invitation as an artist. And that's what the practice rests on. This video is a minute long. It may be triggering. So if anyone wishes to check out for a minute, you're welcome to do so. But I'll keep it on screen. Should I press play or just press and play at the back? is not the video, the one before this, the one before. The one before this needs to play. While that thought itself out, 
um, that was just a call to action video that had a number of uh, testimonials uh, from survivors of violence, which um, includes so many of us. Um, and uh, and while that uh, while we wait for that, I'd just like to add that you know we're ambitiously and audaciously working towards um, bringing 10,000 Dharman testimonials together one day. Um, and the reason why I say 10,000 is really so that it fosters uh, collaboration. It, com it continues to ask questions around who is yet to be heard, who is yet to uh, who is yet to be heard, and and who and you know how do we and what and sort of what what is the kind of labor that it would take to do this? What are the kind of listening circles it rests on? And most importantly, when these garments in its different stages with its audio testimonials. Um, yeah, so the reason why we put out this audacious number really is so that it propels us into recognizing the amount of work that is yet to be done and the uh, solidarities that have to be built and the healing that is um, that is that is that is being that is being um, and offered. And um, and maybe that's that's cool to my so I never asked for it that our memories need a place. And that uh, nobody is alone, and um, and that there are many yet to be heard, and the conversation on and, and also you know how does listening uh, because it it demands and begs for and more than begs it really demands that we have a, a community of listeners and what does listening do and what shifts does listening allow um, is is uh, when somebody is spoken to without fingers being pointed at as somebody raised the question around caste. Um, and privilege uh, in the earlier session was how do we stay in a state of constant discomfort and be brave in asking those uncomfortable questions around us who are we yet to listen to? Um, I'll play this. I mean, thanks for talking this out. I'll just play this video. Also request you to ignore the 2022. The video was made pre-pandemic. This video is uh, uh, made pre-pandemic, so we've converted 2023 to a live practice uh, rather than pushing it all in one year or in one period of time because there's a lot to be done. And I'm looking at all of you, even though in the dark, I'll add out. Um, we move on to the, the also, you know, this is, and we, to build, I never ask for it, it rests on forging and building these relationships uh, with groups, with allies, with individuals. It also rests on uh, these public actions called walk towards healing, which we did very recently as well, where they're walking, shouldering this responsibility of gender-based violence and victim blame, where members of the public, people on the street, are so strangers also join in. And, um, and the idea again being that the, the burden of memory is not the survivors alone. Um, again, I'm unable to move this. Can you just move to the next slide?
and um, while I never asked for it, continues to be in the direction of building testimonials of violence and, and iterating ways of uh, being able to do so and work together. The other half of the practice really rests on creating place to imagine and protecting our right to imagine. That uh, it's one thing to say, um, you know, we want to end violence, and the other is to also protect that labor and create that kind of labor which is around what do we imagine and how should this imagination also occupy the public. So again, from, and, and how do we also recognize that we've been raised to experience fear and what does it mean to resist that through imagination and, and resist that with the pursuit of also belonging and defensiveness. Uh, and again, I've arrived at these articulations 15 years later, but back in 2005, we were doing things like just learning to be idle in public spaces. And uh, whether it was one of us or 20 of us, or one day 100 of us, there were always questions around what are you doing here? Are you waiting for someone? And because we were blog based and there was um, different chapters, one kind of organizing that we had was there were again citizen led chapters across the country these actions would happen simultaneously in different uh, cities and um, and a community was being formed around this. Again, could we move to the next slide? I don't think this is working. Um, this was also a project on occupying with laughter. Again, laughter clubs are a familiar form. And um, we, uh, I was working with students at Srishti Institute of Art, Design and Technology, and we were looking at neighborhoods and how could neighborhoods also foster belonging. This is a video. I hope it plays. It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> We went door to door inviting women who lived around the park um, to join this, uh, this club and we collectively named it the Ha 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 Sangha. Again, it offers a projection of what it could be. So everything that we've done are projections or tools of what could be a collective action. And how do we, how do we, uh, form, how do, how do friendship, how do, how do friendship offer and coming together and occupying through that. So this is a, this is a perfect, uh, laugh. <laughs> it's been really missing. We, uh, named different laughs and the Churair laugh, they were, um, you know, different laughs. Um, which I'm really missing Babita and I hope we get to hear. <laughs> Can we play that again, just a little bit? I was waiting for her. <laughs> we we um, went door to door inviting uh, women residents specifically of Yalahanka. Uh, and this park around in, within Yalahanka, and we gathered and we met every day for a you know for a month, and uh, we formed the Ha 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 Sangha to also see if this could lead to friendships, if friendships could dissolve uh, this feeling of threat and fear and foster belonging, and also simultaneously occupying our parks, our cities, our public spaces with our voice, with our bodies, uh, with joy. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So, yeah, I'll stick to this. I'll, 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 in the interest of time, I'll uh, remove this. Um, but the two are connected. Um, like I said, half our practice is on listening and building testimonials. The other half of the practice is really about 
um, designing actions based on desire, on what we, you know, allow ourselves to believe we deserve um, in our, as our bodies and our public spaces. Um, so I think it was 2007 is when we did this event online called I Wish, I Believe, and we invited bloggers and um, you know, various people to share to send their wishes for the city. And I was very struck by how simple these wishes were. Somebody said, I wish to be able to get wet in the rain without having to worry about somebody looking at my clothes. Somebody said, I just wish to wear that red lipstick and uh, walk skipping. Somebody else uh, wanted to wear a certain pair of earrings. And at that time, I also used that moment to make a wish for myself. And I said, I want to sleep in Bangalore Southern Park. So the next year, a small group of us, Action Shiro Saumya, she says she dared herself by sitting alone under a tree. There was Action Shiro Saraswati who said, I dared myself by sitting alone on a bench and stretching and yawning and pouting. Uh, there was me and Action Shiro Saraswati, we, we both wanted to sleep. And I went there equipped with this blanket on a pillow and um, I was really ready to fall asleep and excited to do so and know that I was in the presence of my peers. Um, and yet I couldn't sleep. I cried and I almost went into sleep more than I would wake up uh, and then realized it was just this crackling leaf. And then again, go back into sleep mode and again wake up and realize it was just a dog walking by. And I just lay there um, thinking about the presence of fear in my own body and being so aware of what is fear uh, that was normal and is normal for so many of us. Um, and I lay there thinking about the fact that all of us somewhere have been told to be careful and that there are more of us in fear of each other than with the actual intention to harm each other. And how do we look at that as a premise? How do we look at that truth as a premise in terms of how we foster cities and public spaces or even homes of belonging? The slide that I skipped, the only part I want to share from that project talk to me was really about questioning the politics of fear because it brought two strangers to talk to each other and it confronted us women action shiros or those identifying as women action shiros to also question which type of man have you been taught to fear. So the po questioning the politics of fear has been very much part of the practice in trying to understand gender-based violence as well. Um, again going back to need to sleep but uh, through, through this act of trying to sleep you know and, and with this um, insight. Uh, I just lay there imagining what would happen if thousands of women were sleeping in public spaces um, with the choice and leisure to do so. And what would happen to our public spaces to witness this? What would happen to our bodies to experience this? Uh, would that disrupt the story of fear that we inherit? A few years later, like I said, the pursuit and questions have also been around um, how do we build this together? What is the shared common ground? What is feminist solidarity? Um, so Needs to Sleep really as an idea has been built by nearly 50 feminist collectives and organizations across the country. It rests also on uh, Good Blank Noise labor also rests on collective feminist labor. Everything that we do is built with and in alliance with. Um, and as again as an artist, I'm designing ideas or proposing ideas rooted in community listening. And it's also often with. Um, but so from this, a few years later, we have Niche to Sleep, which is built with um, many allies. Can we move to the next slide? And uh, we sleep claiming the right to be defenseless. Can we move to the next slide? You can just uh, slowly go over the next slide. It's been built in Hazari Bagh. Um, we just move to the next slide. By Sadhavna Trust in Lucknow. We move to the next slide by Azad Foundation. And after we sleep, after we do, every year also it's held on 16th December, but this is something that we're also changing in terms of, uh, you know, potentially exploring this in August this year. Uh, can we also pause here and play Kamlaji's video? So it also rests on, um, it rests on people like Kamlaji holding that megaphone. Lying in the sun, weak or sleep. So 
say goodbye to the fear inside. We will let the world know that India, its streets, its roads, its paths belong to us within also. We'll tell everyone that in 1947, freedom came not just for Bharat, but also for Bharatis. Will you do the same? Can you play the black box? Please? Hello, everyone. This is Eswara from Bhopal. We will be organizing Need to See campaign on 15th of December. That is Sunday, where we map across public parks, reclaiming spaces in the tent. खराब मैं हूं हमीदा सदवाना ट्रस्ट से और इस बार हम अलग-अलग पहचान की लड़कियां और महिलाएं मी टू स्लीप को अपना बना रही हैं यानी 15 दिसंबर को हम सारी लड़के इकट्ठा हो रहे हैं और एक ऐसे खुले मैदान में पार्क में जहां पर हम खुल के सांस ले सकें जहां पर हम बिना डरे अपने नींद को भर सकें तो इस तरह से हमें सुरक्षित माहौल बनाना है खासकर हम औरतों के लिए तो इस पूरे कैंपेन को हम आगे ले जाएंगे और इसी तरह से हम सारी लड़कियां मिलकर बिना शर्म के बिना झिझक के बिना डर के और उस खुले आसमान में नींद भरेंगे और साथ ही साथ धूप की गर्मी अपने जिस्म में उतारेंगे तो हमें लगता है कि इस चीज की शुरुआत हमारे लिए बहुत ही अहम है बहुत ही पुख्ता है और जिससे हम अपनी हाजिरी दर्ज करा पाएंगे Thank you. We move to the next slide. And the next slide again. Hello everyone. After the Shivani Sai, let's see the Saturday, 16 December. Your big movement is Donnet and we claim our rights on public spaces. Okay. So we claim that the reason over the Shivani Sai, we will do it. We will do it. We will do it. Because later we will do it. 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 जब तो मम्मी को बोलना पड़ता है कि चलो तो पार्क में चलो तो बात करने का मन है तो नहीं आ सकती मैं मैं तो एंडिंग कर रही हूँ एंड आई एम डन विथ बॉडीगार्ड जैसे अब और बॉडीगार्ड नहीं चाहिए लेकिन पब्लिक से सबके लिए बना था मेरे लिए भी बना है तो मैं अपने राइट्स को रिक्लेम कर दूँगी ऑन सैटरडे Can we play the next slide, please? And uh, again, Anandi, another organization based in Gujarat, uh, they have been called the Meet to Sleep Allies, and it led them to also create their own campaign called Jagya Hamari. And the next slide, please. This, um, so we haven't done Meet to Sleep in the last two years with the pandemic, and we're working towards Meet to Sleep in August uh, this year. Uh, also to look at, you know, whose violence, um, to open this up in terms of whose violence are we remembering and whose violence must we pledge to not forget. Um, so, and again, in the interest and the commitment to holding place or, or ensuring that there's a plurality here is also, you know, if we did this in August, and every community could identify a person or a uh, or another, you know, or could identify someone they pledge to not forget, or we must all collectively not forget. So also opening it up is uh, the commitment in terms of whose violence. This is a very recent interview with Pratima Kumari, who uh, is in Shorampur. Um, and, um, you know, some organizations, regardless of this one call to action and one day have, you know, been going ahead and just doing it. So we have this right and I'll close uh, with one more slide. Audio. I am going to go to the hospital and go to the hospital. I am going to go to the hospital.
जंगल में एक्सरसाइज का भी फॉरेस्ट सर्वे बनाया हो तो उस दिन मैंने जैसे ही देखी इतना सुंदर वो सारे फूल के पत्ते हैं और ऐसे लग रहा था कि पत्ते ऐसे मीठे पड़े हैं कि आओ मेरे लिए उधर काली मीठा है तो ऐसे ही धरती पे वो पत्ते ऐसे दिखे इतना सुंदर लग रहा था कि मैं गिरी और ऐसे देख रही थी आधे लोगों की नजर मेरी तरफ ये तेरी क्या कर रही है पागल लेकिन उसके लिए मैंने जा मुझे कोई फर्क नहीं पड़ता कि लोग क्या कहेंगे मुझे एक मोटिवेट करता है मुझे चीज किया एक गार्ड जो है हमारे भीतर की भाई हम अपने बॉडी के साथ से हेल्प नहीं है लोगों के सामने हम लेट नहीं सकते लोगों के सामने सीना दाग के बैठ नहीं सकते चल नहीं सकते इन चीजों से निकलना और हमारे साथ क्योंकि हमारा काम ही पूरा का पूरा केंद्रित है महिलाओं के ओन का को लेके तो हम जब भी बात करते हैं तो उनको यही कहते हैं कि अगर आपको लगता है कि आप सहज नहीं है वो काम बिल्कुल लेकिन वो होता है ना कि उसको पहचानना भी तो जरूरी है कि ये सहज क्यों नहीं है मूव टू द नेक्स्ट स्लाइड and uh, the next slide again and uh, again while listening to uh, different feminist allies uh, describe uh, what meet to keep has uh, you know what is that experience so there are different vocabularies that are emerging and we've been making notes that are connected also like bebaki peda gives birth to fearlessness or there's uh, sukoon there's uh, peace uh, there's fear there's maza which is fun um and also the seeding of duniya badal jayegi and uh, the next part which also speaks to how can artists work uh, in this is there a question of tareeka or methodology and how do we as artists design methodologies uh, for change with community so that's the next slide um and we close with uh, we we'll just close with three questions really um can we move to the next um is really around um what does it mean really to occupy public spaces as post strangers uh, be, you know bearing witness and the ability to listen um what do cities and public spaces of belonging look and feel like and um, how does you know how do we push this conversation of safety to a place of belonging and uh, third is uh, what does it mean to occupy public spaces with a fear Uh, with a fiercely defenseless body, and uh, as much as I'd like to read out the text to you, just in the interest of time, of course. Thank you. Thanks, Jasmin. Sorry to cut you short, but I think you did good. Hi, uh, I'm Anku, and uh, after that really long presentation, I <laughs> kind of fumbled with words. Um, so I've been working on the streets for over a decade, and um, my practice mainly uh, started with this fantastic piece. Um, I was uh, working with a friend, and uh, she walked around this neighborhood in Chitti, and I identified some spaces. And she said, "Hey, why don't you come along and let's um, see if you would like to do a painting on it?" And um, I was like, "Yeah, why not?" Um, at I at no point did I know what is it that I was going to do. What did it mean to be walking and working and looking and understanding and feeling and making? Um, none of these questions um, you know, really were important at that point. How was I going to paint it? This is me, 5.5, and sort of a 40 foot long canvas. How was I going to make a painting? Standing up a 20 foot ladder, my nose pointing and touching the wall. How am I even going to draw this? Um, it, it, you know, I went around. I started drawing. Uh, I went up, you know, made a line, came down back, and said, "Hey, okay, fine. You know, I've got some things right." It took me over three days to just make the drawing. But in the process of doing this. 
um, I spend over eight hours on the streets. I spend a lot of time um, worried. I spend a lot of time feeling um, insecure because I did not know what is it that I was doing. But I also had a lot of fun. Um, I enjoyed being up there on the ladder. I enjoyed looking down at the world. I enjoyed uh, just looking at people who were walking by asking me questions. I didn't have any answers. I had to talk to a child and an old person and tell them what is it that I was doing on the street. I had absolutely no clue. This was my first painting. But it was important for me to visualize this and make this. It was, it was great because finally I could draw big. From sitting in a ca canvas, sitting on a canvas in a studio to actually going out there and moving my arms and making something and you know responding to it. Um, there was there weren't many great responses to this piece. Um, and over the years, uh, my learning has come from working on the streets. I don't have a style. I don't adhere to any uh, particular uh, theme. I feel the kind of works that I do are very site specific, uh, and I'm mainly interested in trying to create an emotional connect with the people, um, because I'm, I don't believe I'm a social commentator in that level. Um, what does it look like when you see a blank wall or the canvas? And how is it that you're going to um, make something which is kind of viewed by a larger public, which is the people on the streets? And how are they going to respond to the kind of work that you do? Who is my audience? The main audience that mainly street art gets is social media. and But that's not the audience I am speaking. I'm interested in talking to the people who live there. Um, the kind of communities, I don't even know. I only know that, okay, there is a star there, there's a mandir, there's a church. Um, but what can I make over there? I went about making a moon. For me, it was the biggest giant Wi-Fi in the sky. Everyone yearns for the moon. Lovers think about their loved ones when they think of the moon. Um, how can I then you know, bring people to a collective consciousness? Um, and you know, kind of connect them. I don't know if I'm connecting them, but connect the artwork, but have an emotional relay with the kind of work that I'm doing. Um, a very interesting incident happened while I was painting. There was a local goon who used to hang around there, and he definitely what does it mean to be written to him. He wanted to own it. For me, that was great because finally there was something that he felt belonged. I didn't know if it belonged. You know, I was also just searching and trying many things out, and Yesterday, Vijeta talked about uh, uh, how difficult it is for Dalits to um, you know, internalize the idea of an artist. I study that, so I by default think I'm an artist. But over the years, that idea has changed. Um, I don't look at myself as an artist. I look at myself as a worker on the street. And that realization only came after conversation I had with someone. Um, this is a piece I did in Mahi, and it's a very dense neighborhood. and. Uh, uh, what I really liked was the fact that there was very little space to paint anything, but then one had to paint something, and um, I like the idea. I had to connect the, you know, I had all these things. I had to connect the building and connect the uh, wiring, and you know, I thought like, this girl hanging upside down could be a very interesting drawing. An elderly gentleman came up, and um, you know, he was so happy. He gave me a box of chocolates, and he was like, I don't know what you've done, but you made me think of my childhood and how I used to hang upside down from a wall. And thank you so much for it. You don't really realize the power of an image until someone actually you know, hits it and throws it back at you. And I was so happy. He even wrote a poem about it. It was completely moved. Every girl thought it was an image of a girl, and every guy thought it was an image of a guy. And they all owned it. Uh, and these are not things you anticipate. You only try things out. You only juggle a couple of ideas and try to make things work. Um, this is also in. Uh, um, this is also done in Mumbai. Uh, this is a very coveted wall. The owners didn't want to give it to anyone, and uh, we tried very hard to get this wall. It only happened the day before, and there had been you know, hands of splash all over it. And now it was like, okay, ma'am, now you can come and paint what you want. You know. Uh, uh, while painting this, I left those hand palm prints because I thought they were very interesting. And, I, and I'm not someone who wants to paint everything. I like to leave a bit of the character of the wall. Very careful not to um, pursue a certain idyllic idea of what it should be. I don't want people to be aghast and think, oh my god, this is so cool. That's not the sentiment that I'm looking for. It should sort of fit into the space. There's a huge well where you can see the kids are sitting. 
still have to go through this interaction. So I'll give it to Atul to inside it. So I'm always trying to make some connection with this place. A year later, I was sent an image of uh, how beautifully they painted the blue area, you know, to preserve it. And I like these responses. I like the fact that people want to preserve something that was made and, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, and own it as well. Um, I put this image just to show you what does it look like. I never know what I look like when I start to imagine and uh, make a painting. And what are the uh, questions you ask yourself when you kind of come towards making art in public spaces? Um, this is a warehouse in Alipura. Alipura now is one of my favorite cities. Um, I, I work solo. There's another thing that I do. Uh, I don't know how to teach uh, people how to train. It's very hard for me to um, you know, uh, share that sort of knowledge because I'm a very quick worker. Uh, and uh, I'm also impatient, and I cannot wait for someone to make the painting. Um, so um, I had this really large wall. It's like a big three meters uh, 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 large wall. And the people who were working in this warehouse were um, fire makers. Um, they made a lot of um, um, ropes and stuff. So I thought it would be interesting to them to try to bring that sentiment out onto the streets. And uh, to see, and I also hope you play with the idea of what you do with a really long wall. Uh, and how that could be a really interesting um, way to, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, try and do something in the streets. While I worked uh, on this piece, um, there was a guy who came, and these are, uh, you know, I always have people who come by and talk to me. Um, so this gentleman who came by, uh, came by me, and he talked about the city. And he talked about how is it not a He just started off by talking, cursing the city, cursing the politicians. I think everybody, and here I was wondering, oh my god, I wonder if this is a open right? You know, do you think it's going to make an impact? But uh, I, I then realized that I'm a mediator. Oh, I, I, have, I listen to these stories that people, I've had people tell me about which part of the city I should visit, why I am doing something. Oh, oh, oh man, you know, I am there, you know, uh, please acknowledge me. Uh, there's a death and new person who used to drive, try to buy every day. And so many different gestures, he could just tell me how much he enjoyed. He wrote down on his hand that I work right here. Uh, or a school girl would go by and, you know, like just smile and smirk at me. And he said, I'm just standing there in front of I own this place. There's a chai shop. Now you can go to Alapura and go to Shavakota Palam and you go to Jimon chai shop and you'll tell you stories about me. I wake up at 6.30, I walk around uh, 15 minutes to get to the site. Uh, I have all my, uh, you know, um, what do you say, a paraphernalia just there. I have to pick it all up, a ladder, paint, and come there and work from, you know, 7 to 11, and then I take a break, and then all the way to 6, and I'm there. Everyone sees me do it. And that's when I got an auto rickshaw ride, and this guy said, Ma'am, I'm not going to take money from you because you're the worker. And that was interesting. You know, I am a worker in this city, and people recognize me like that. And but I do not know the kind of image that I'm portraying. Um, and every day I would go by and have a fish thali, and I love fish, and it's one of those things that I can't resist when I'm in Kerala. And uh, the guy who, uh, they go to the same place and they know you, and then, you know, paper, uh, there was a newspaper article that, you know, showed the piece, and everybody knew that it was, a, you know, it was done by me. And he said, ma'am, I came by with my child, and I, he just stood there and watched me. And this was something that you, uh, I don't know, it, it had, I felt it was the moment, and I've seen many um, men bring their little kids to come by and watch me paint. It's just about how much, you know, how much you enjoy being in this paper and how much you can change. I don't know that, I didn't know that women could paint. I'm like, of course women can paint, but maybe you've not seen them do something in the public. But um, that's very important for me to just, just to understand that, yes, I'm standing there trying to devise all these, the thinking of art and what can it mean and who are the, who's the public and what is the viewer and what does it resonate, but there's also you standing there as a symbol of portraying something and just having fun. I have a lot of fun, even in this heat, I'm sweaty, it's horrible, I've probably just eaten one meal a day, but I'm back every day and I don't stop until I finish and I love it. It's an absolute rush for me, but it's also very spontaneous and it's very momentary. I never go back and revisit the piece. I'm not melancholic about what I've done. I don't think about, you know, what I've done. I'm always thinking about what I can do next. 
which is the new space that I can occupy, and what should occupy, which is the new space that I can come into and try something out. Um, this also is this is also in Alapura, and this is done by the canal, like what is you know, uh, a fossilized fish or like a, a fish that is, is sort of thrown away, remnants. I was thinking of remnants while I was making this piece, and um, and I um, I was thinking a lot about wastage because it was the time of COVID, and you know it was important to preserve and you know to, there's a lot of which just stand right there, and uh, this guy walks up to me and says, "Man." Well, the most tasty fish. And in no way did I even imagine that the fish was there. But I didn't see it. I, I had all of this knowledge about what it is that I was going to make, but it took someone else to actually tell me what it actually meant. Once I made it, it was this. So um, realizations of this. And the, and the tea shop is right there uh, on the left of the space. Uh, and every day I would go, uh, in the afternoon I would unwind, charge my phone, drink a cup of tea, everyone was inside would walk out, and we'd have conversations about, I don't know, the day, man, we should move to Alapura, you know, this is a great city, um, and it was just a normal day, and I would leave slowly. I was not in haste, I did not want to hurry back to my room or do anything, but I just wanted to just sit. And um, oh dear, me, this once told me that, that that's a luxury. I'm like, yeah, it is a luxury to be standing outside painting, having tea, having conversations, and having a whale of a time with no one who has anything to do with art, all my practice, all my peers, and nothing. But just basic conversations. And um, this one's a Malaysian one, so I took some uh, pieces from Bangalore to see and to see um, what is it that you can do in these spaces. It's not one idea. Every space is different. Every wall is different. Every street corner is different. A lamppost can, you know, um, trigger you. But it's also a piece can trigger you. I have to leave it. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, uh, and over here, Malaysian is a slightly um, upscale neighborhood. So, this uh, beautiful woman in the sari and gold is I know, we just seen a woman too. It was just so great. And, and it, it was these conversations. And this, the recognition that you also symbolize something more than what it is. Um, um, this was done in Trivandrum, literally a hundred foot. And uh, I, I'm also very daring. I, I paint freehand. You know? I like to struggle with my work. I like to see it come to life. I like to stay in a bit. And you know, this, uh, by the time I had done this piece, it was already my third painting. Which was small, but why I put the slide there was. There's a guy that came by from the other side of the um, uh, the underpass and he said, wow, Kerala, we love you, but this is also great. Because that is it. It's a, a lot of things are these moments of connection. And I painted headless people playing badminton in terms of the sound, the pose, and it doesn't matter what you do. You can always push the boundaries of what is it that you can do in these spaces. This is again in Alapura. Alapura, again, I've, I've been called twice, and it's one of my favorite places to be. Um, and this was a very uh, interesting moment that happened to me. And uh, on the left, you see this uh, rickshaw, this is an auto rickshaw guy, and he was like, ma'am, I have to bring my grandchildren to come and see you. And I received Guru Dakshina on the street, right there. It was the first money I received from any project at Alapura. It was from these little kids. And, um, and I, I was so emotional. I didn't know what to do. I don't even know what it what it means to be a mentor. But then I feel like no, no, you just need to bless my kid. And this happened right on the street. And that's that's it. that's Jimon and his friend, the auto rickshaw guy. And they made me paint a chai ka glass uh, in their chai shop. You can't. It was like a test for me. I was standing there. Uh, I painted big, big walls, but tried to paint in front of twenty men. You know, just my hands were shaking. It was like, you know, everyone was looking at you, but uh, he's very proud of it. So if you ever go to Shavakotapur and you will meet Jimo. Uh, um, I would like to end with a slide, with one more slide, but talking about what is it to see a sunset on a street? And how that is what I take back with me every time I'm on the street painting. The fact that I finished the day of work, the fact that I'm able to stand up way up high and see things that no one wants to see, that I embody that space, that 
vacuum of space. This is not in the ground, it's not up in the air, it's somewhere in between. And I can, you know, just immerse myself within it. And I'm happy. And I want to always be back and standing on a scab and painting. Thank you. Thanks, Anju. That was fantastic. I think if you ever do a tour, taking a sidekick along, I would sign up. It's just fantastic. Uh, hi, um, not very well, so I'm just going to have to leave. Um, I'm not as exciting as both of my, my other panelists who are very uh, much more animated than I would be today. Uh, thank you, Lakshmi and Vaishali, for um, uh, introducing and organizing this panel. Thank you, Matt, for inviting us again. Uh, it's a really difficult uh, topic and contested within Mara itself, this uh, whole business of public and public space. And we've been journeying with it, leaving it, coming back uh, over the years. So uh, I think the best way for us to talk about uh, uh, um, our understanding of public space would be to just kind of maybe take you through some of the things we learned along the way and questions we're still left with um, uh, at the moment. So uh, um, uh, you can just play it. This, this is not a presentation. It's just like many, many. So all the images that you see are the things that we've done uh, over the last 15 years in different kinds of public spaces. So it's not really in any uh, particular order, because I think that's also the point of it, maybe. Uh, so uh, when we started work on public space as a response to election free spaces, uh, given the various infrastructural shifts in the city, uh, like the metro and this excitement to become a smart city, high tech city, etc. Uh, we kind of um, were also meeting a lot of people who were displaced and uh, also the influx of migrant labor into the city. And of course, the felling of trees and various things were happening simultaneously at the same time. So we were involved in most of those protests. And uh, these acts of violence uh, were systematically hidden by. Uh, conditioning beautification drives across the city where we saw trees, flowers, and rainbows as open canvases against piles of dead trees, demolition, and debris. So, while there were several protests proposing alternatives to the space to reconsider this form of development, they were mostly sidelined. And uh, several artists and art groups at the time reclaiming public spaces in Bangalore uh, tried to assert the need for it back in, this is back in 2008. So I'm just uh, going to go over three key markers that I think uh, shaped our work. Was the first Bangalore Pride, uh, which was crucial in occupying public space, where many raised the act of coming out uh, while urging for Section 277 to be repealed. The second marker is the protest against the building of the Bangalore Metro, and the third marker is the protest against the demolition of uh, the economic weak, uh, economically weak section, which is the EWS quarters and EV to run. These are three main events that happened at the time which kind of pushed us and our thinking to try and look at what we can do in public spaces. Since then, as demonstrated in the photos behind me, I don't know which photo, there are many random photos, just let them go. Since then, as demonstrated uh, in the photos, uh, came different ways of using public spaces. So we used it for rehearsals, creating performances, bringing artists in conversation with each other. We occupied different public parks with the idea that public space was being reclaimed for the art. Sooner than later, we realized that the word public is crucial to public space. As we used different public spaces, the public interacting with our work um, were also, also the, we also felt like somehow they were being denied the right of public space itself. So uh, uh, there was a lot of confusion in this word of citizen, public, public space, and, uh, at, and we, we had quite a lot of debates within, within Mara itself. And uh, for example, uh, um, like groups like Paura Karnikas, the people who are the waste pickers in uh, Bangalore, uh, they would have occupied public space as a site of protest, but they would still not be considered within the ambit of the public who have a right within the city. So public spaces are dynamic, and uh, we believe that um, street vendors, and street workers can have it uh, and use public 
these things present. Uh, but um, we also had to kind of interact, uh, deal with uh, resident welfare associations, which are prevalent in all areas in Bangalore, uh, who, of course, continue to prioritize their right to leisure um, over the rights of these communities to use it for work. So we started structuring our work in public space in collaboration with the diverse public to uh, use public space for particular forms of labor, as we felt that there was systematic invisibilization of labor in the name of building this uh, high-tech smart city. So civic programs and urban design programs, litter-free zones, eco-friendly <coughs> parks, pet-friendly parks, surveillance, waste management, all of these words started kind of becoming very uh, prominent uh, after the metro and other such things started getting sanctioned, uh, which focused only on space, so hardly the people who were involved in the everyday engagement making of the space. So we created walks and exhibitions around subversion inhabited public spaces to support everyday life with people in authority, the police, government officials, and that we in the residents of Bangalore. Try to measure beyond living and working conditions, um, but also uh, um, but also something that we try to focus on. So uh, we, we used to keep wondering, like, who is curating this event if it's led by workers? So we kind of did um, a public space called Samsa, which is behind Ravindra Kalakshetra, where we kind of brought together various women workers to um, just plan an evening and do whatever it is that they wanted to do on stage. And it was a really fascinating uh, curation because I think they just let themselves go and it went on for something like five, six hours. And it was, I think, the first time that they had all come together to do something like this. So they brought together tech workers, domestic workers, garment workers, and power garments in Bangalore. So our work focused uh, subsequently on also the evictions of these vendors where, um, and untouchability practices uh, that specifically with power garments, harassment of women in public space, surveillance. And uh, there's a lot of police violence also that uh, we have come to know of uh, in a particular period of time, which I think was 2015, uh, where there was a certain inspector in a district who was being extremely, um, um, extremely harsh to the sex workers who were working in that area. So there was a lot of, uh, so most of our work was kind of defined by conversations that we were having with different kinds of uh, people that we met people. Unions and other women in the city. Um, the labor of garbage disposal unraveled the nasty caste dynamics from the authorities to contractors to workers to finally the real segregators and landfill workers. People uh, uh, are divided on caste lines, and it was the most visible aspect of labor. When we worked on safety audits for women in the city, we learned that concerns for upper middle class women were radically different. Than that for working class women. Uh, I, um, in some of the focus group discussions, I remember that the Parvatarnika mentioned that the most important things for them in public space were the toilets, uh, which they still don't have access to. And there's also very basic needs like safe drinking water, a place to rest because it's very hot and they start working from 6 o'clock in the morning. So, where would you actually, where is the infrastructure for? Um, the systematic, um, um, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> the systematic injustice was hard to notice. It was, uh, in our view at the time, pure, a pure class war. Middle and upper class interests were protected to keep miscreants and dangerous people away. Uh, public spaces had to be sanitized uh, of a certain public, which invited architectural changes and access to participation in that. Our uh, engagements and protests in public space allowed us to learn a lot about the complexity of how the city is structured and nests in violence that needs to be fought for on a consistent basis, as exploitation is very much at the heart of politics. So, who were these miscreants, thieves, and dangerous people? Our work took us back to the rehabilitation sites where many of the ghettos of Bangalore are segregated by caste and religion. Uh, we worked with several unions to learn the complexity of sexy and women workers who comprise a significant percent of the population to include uh, the Karnakas garment workers, sex workers, and domestic workers. Their accounts of the city and employers reveal a very bleak picture of the public and public space. Through 
Reading, which means read, a bi-monthly newspaper which we published in Canada, Hindi, and in English. We gathered accounts of growth from gossip and inequality, discrimination, resisted by everyday protests, which does not always take the form of an organized political protest. Um, many, many of them mentioned that um, every day is a protest, and protest is an everyday practice. Hence, it is important to note the role of media and how it, been, how it has been biased to always show the worker in a wrong and respectful light. To date, the total and such work was reduced to less growth, workers account for these to better accounts and accidents, simply ignoring the fact that they are uh, uh, completely ignoring the fact that they are in fact the lifeline of the country. It became very crucial for us uh, across our work to think about women. Uh, which work, which women, which workers, which areas, because they cannot be homogenized under the category without recognizing other connected factors of caste, religion, sexuality, and of course, class. Over the years of learning from lived experiences uh, of several people in the city, our work moved away from the public space because our work was no longer about an abstract public in an abstract public space. We zeroed in on building our work as longer processes where we internally had to clarify to ourselves why, where, and to whom that we address in our work. What is their involvement in creating work? How do we come to work? Questions of representation were discussed because we wondered how much are we embodied in an experience when telling the stories of others. We could see how our communication shifted to different audiences. After COVID, we felt there was in public space. Spaces that did not belong to the public, which was at the cost of not letting someone else in, filled with rules, regulations, and restrictions, the dangerous outsider. As we engaged with food economy workers and migrant workers, we learned that we remain disconnected as a public. The state has a role in engineering that. The private sector has a role in protecting their interests, and everyone outside it is perhaps fighting it in a disorganized way. Several battles spawn out of identity formation, uneven accumulation of wealth, and others. Uh, uh, I mean, there were many, many protests that took place just before COVID. I mean, everyone would be familiar with the CA and RC protests. Uh, but what we realized is people were also coming together uh, briefly because there was already something else to protest for at that time. And then I think COVID happened. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah. So this is a this was for us a good cue to unravel the idea of the public that it is formed in brief moments of time and context. It is fluid and always in flux. The space is incidental. Place becomes spacious because a base can be used it. How it is used and what is it used for. There are therefore sites of radical possibilities as long as there is concerted effort and attention to which kinds of public can be used. The second uh, question for us is who gets to talk about occupying public space? The people who use it for their livelihood are too busy working with little or no time for leisure. They would, uh, they would not need to occupy public space, they inhabit public space. The idea of occupying implies that something is denied to the public. What and who occupies the public and how is it For those denied the use of public space, are we imagining and using space creatively through different forms of art? I mean, uh, recently we met a a uh, very uh, new collective of filmmakers called Nida Varna, uh, who produced fantastic films uh, um, which focus on their life in Bangalore from their perspective. And uh, the Jagama Collective, who we believe are trying to bring out stories which are not really, who have, stories that have been systematically left out of the main, uh, main so called dominant discourses. Uh, we work, we were very lucky to work with a group of uh, very old. Um, uh, senior transgender um, people in the city on a photo exhibit called Sweet View, where all their fantasies of occupying um, um, uh, occupying public spaces could be reimagined differently. And part of that work is in the collection visible in the visitors. So, I mean, these are just explorations of what uh, what happens when voices that have been systematically left out really start taking the floor, right? And uh, finally, I think um, I think the, the whole idea of private fears being expressed in public spaces um, is also something we have been thinking about, which is that cities also a 
not allow anonymity for anyone to see who they wish to be in public space. And it's frustrating. There's danger and freedom, there's friction and mobility, there's also the inherent ambiguity of public space. Um, to give away public spaces, um, I mean, the ambiguity is always there in terms of who controls the public space and how. So, um, of course, we know that today we have uh, sound which is self exercise public space in the different ways. Whether it's, um, I mean, I'm telling you this in this case, but there are several parts of the city which have been occupied by particular aesthetic concerns, which are now uh, where other sounds are being silenced. So I think we just need to be uh, ever conscious to absorb these different things uh, that are happening around us and, be, uh, and, and, and kind of find ways to see where we fit in or where we need to take a step from. Uh, I thought I would just end with an imagination of a public space that I just uh, 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 I just heard about through a long conversation with me and some of our friends. Uh, who they basically work on a research on public spaces in Bangalore. And they wrote about this place called Degan Mahal, which is a bus stop near the IC actually. And I thought that that was a very beautiful place to talk about Hindi and the Uh Begum Mahal, uh, of course, only people in Bangalore only remember it as a memory. There's no evidence of this place. Uh, the bus stop is there, but the bungalow is not there. And it's about a woman uh, called Begum who um, uh, was a school lady. And she used to kind of. Uh, in her bungalow, she allowed all kinds of people to come in, um, uh, auto rickshaw drivers, destitute women and men, um, trans people, um, and several workers who could come there, who could eat, who could sleep, who could have sex, who could rest, who could just be. And uh, I wonder if we are also in search of somewhat of that lost space that we can't really find maybe in Bangalore, but we aspire to maybe build. Uh, along with, I guess, whoever is there to work with us on this big amount. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my views. Thanks, Ekta. That was, uh, I mean, really a dream project. I think good note to begin a conversation. So I believe uh, we have just about 15 minutes for the conversation. Maybe we can have the lights on so that everyone can be seen. Right. Thanks for bringing out, you know, the range of experiences in the public in terms of, you know, violence and fear and intimidation to joy and power and a dream. And I think that's what it feels so open now. The other one aspect that has not been focused so much on, but we've all experienced in the past about two years, is the online space and the online publics and what that means to... Uh, look at the fissures which very much mirror the physical world, whether it's, you know, who has access, who has power, who has privilege, uh, who has, uh, you know, who is intimidated, who, who is joyous, who is creative, who is expressive. So I think if we can look at uh, all of these aspects, because this is what we are confronting now on a daily basis, uh, that, that might lead to an interesting conversation. So, yeah, the floor is open. Um, hi, uh, I actually had a question and a bit of an observation for Anku. It's okay. Um, so, when it comes to art, um, because uh, I create art, through the process of creating art myself and putting it up on Instagram and having friends and people view it, I've also uh, come to realize that a lot of people come back to you as an artist to say, 
you know, I watch what you do because uh, what I like to do is usually make time lapses of what I'm doing digitally, not physically, or either ways. And the experience of people coming back to you and saying, you know, this inspires me, or um, I watch what you do and watch the way your hands move or watch the way you sit and look at something before you start creating becomes something that intrigues me as an artist as well where uh, so i related with you on that aspect saying you know it's um it's an experience of its own to have people come back and listen to you so my and also because i've um Live, living in Bangalore, I've seen your uh, moon mural, and I always, every time I went past also, I used to, <laughs> I used to just imagine what you know the artist was thinking when that huge moon, right, uh, through my school days and even now. So, um, how does this kind of um, public and personal opinion kind of influence the way you create uh, your murals? Um, when you create them, do you ever wonder, saying, uh, every time you step back, right, to like look at what you've created, I know you said that you just, um, once you create it, you never go back to it. You just, it's done, it's something that's existing now. So um, do you ever create something so that people look at, us, uh, look at it a certain way, or is it just something that, you know, just pops up in your mind and it's there? questions uh one would be for just me uh, in terms of occupying the public space right um, i first want to talk about access uh, to an elite to a savarna crowd there is a lot more access uh, i want to talk about whether the same access or even occupy whether the same access applies to somebody from the dalit community somebody from the adivas community because i don't want to talk about even parks i want to talk about temple entries which is still denied to this day so in that context, and knowing that India as a country has urban population, which is half what the rural population is, uh, can this uh, movement or whatever movements we try to do in the urban spaces, can it permeate to the rural spaces as well? And even in urban spaces, can it permeate to uh, those, for lack of a better word, ghettos uh, where the Dalits exist, where uh, the lower socioeconomic uh, OBCs access. Can can we really do this movement? Can we take it there? Uh, it's part one. The same, I think, uh, when talking about sexual violence, um, sexual harassment, sexual violence, including rape, uh, you mentioned that um, what can we do uh, to prevent or what can we do against men uh, doing it? Uh, something along those lines. I, if I'm wrong, I apologize. Uh, but I, I remember the word uh, men coming along this way. And the reason I ask that is definitely patriarchy has a structure there. Patriarchy has a structure there. Uh, but to this day, um, caste is more easily uh, passed on, nurtured uh, by the women of the household. Of course, it's a patriarchal mindset, but it is passed on by the women of the household. And the crimes against women also in rural and urban spaces is different when it caste is involved. So the collective conscience of the nation gets awakened when a caste, when a violence, sexual violence happens in Delhi for Nirbhaya, but the same collective conscience does not get awakened when it happens in Hatras or when it happens for a minority like Bilkis Banu. So how can we, you know, look look and address all of this? How can we ensure the movement permeates? And the second question would be to sorry, very bad at names, so decide to check the. Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, to Antu, um, the spaces where you paint, uh, where, where you put out your uh, art text, do you think uh, you try to, uh, you focus on getting out the art of the people, of the common man there, of the common man, woman, of the, of the crowds there? Because uh, just to give an example of just songs, uh, in, in Chennai, uh, if you were to take up your guitar and play it in the metro, it's considered fancy, it's considered good. But if you were to play Ghana music, which is uh, the genre of music of the common man there, uh, it's a crime. It's actually considered a nuisance. The same applies to art as well. 
uh, graffiti, which becomes art in North Madras, which is a place occupied by the Dalits, generally. Uh, it's a problem when the graffiti is being put up by them. But the same spaces when it happens in a much more posh area is looked up uh, as the aesthetic. So do, do you think your art focuses on uh, representing the common lay people over there? Or is it just art for sake of art? That, that Can I answer before I forget what the questions are? First, to answer your question, um, um, I, I don't, I mean, it's been over a decade now that I've been working on the streets and all my learning has come from the streets, but I don't occupy those spaces for longer than, let's say, seven days or a week. So what I do is very site specific. I look at a space, I look at a wall, I imagine who the viewer is, who's going to be looking at it every day. What would they would like to see? But I do not have these conversations or talk to people about what is it they want to do. That's not, not the kind of practice that I have. Um, but it's more of an introspective question of how can you do something that can have resonance to various kinds of people, from a small girl to a very old gentleman? How can you make something that sort of um, has a, a quirkiness or a, a some sort of um, emotional pillar? And this is what I've tried to do with my art. So it's not art for art's sake. I don't know what that means either. Uh, I'm a practicing artist, which means, yes, I need to do studio and paint. But I also find that what I do is kind of uh, relevant. But I do not do community-based art, which means I do not go to a community and go find out what people they want to paint. But I feel that I'm an individual who can understand what it means to be homeless. What it means to understand that, OK, this is Kerala. I don't go to Bombay, I go to many cities. I go to Rishikesh, I would paint something different in Rishikesh. If I go to Kerala, I would paint something which probably befits the people there, which I imagine people would like to see there. But I feel like everything fits. You can have this perspective like that. But I challenge the viewer. I challenge what it is to make art in public spaces as well. I do not want to paint something you already know. I do not want to know what is it that I'm going to paint. And I never know what I'm going to paint about. And that is what excites me. Being present in these spaces, looking at it from various angles, wondering who's going to walk by, who's going to uh, look at it, who's going to live with it. So the social domain, which is how street art is consumed in India, I do not even look into. I do not even cater to that. But most people see my art through social media. I'm so happy when people say, I've seen your moon every day. It's such a beautiful feeling because it's been, what, seven, eight years now and it's still there. But it resonates and I don't know. So. It grows over time. So is that art for art? Sake? I'm not sure. But yeah, uh, it's definitely not what the community wants because I'm not asking them what they want. Thank you. Uh, graffiti is very acceptable. In fact, I have to tell you the really bitter experience I had when I uh, curated recently uh, at the festival, and uh, uh, I was bold enough to think that I can, uh, you know, um, make something which hasn't been done before. So I got very young artists to come and, um, you know, uh, to, Ker to Kerala to come and paint in these spaces. And some of them were graffiti writers who did not study that. Who don't come from, uh, this guy came from Assam who runs his uh, father's factory business. But I got into this space to come and paint, and um, He's like, I don't even know what to do now. I have seven days to paint. But for me, just to be able to, uh, you know, imagine what he would do in Kerala and paint was more exciting. The organizers hated the fact that I got just random young people to come and paint. But I don't believe that there are uh, any barriers with what is it that you can paint. We should be able to paint anything. We should be able to doodle. We should be able to write crap. I mean, one of the best graffitis I have uh, seen were in Delhi. Uh, um, uh, I don't remember it, but it was a very obscene sort of a line from a hip hop thing. But all of these things should exist in public space. It's not about me orchestrating what this space looks like. No, we need a lot of uh, other things too, which is, you know, um, this verbal gibberish thing. I include it, but it's also about just thinking that you can make something and just sowing. Uh, a little seed, and that's what we try to do with uh, Teruwara. I got a computer science student to come down and paint on the wall, just because I liked her designs, and that was it. There was no merit. I'm not looking for artists. I'm 
democracy. How do you respond to a public can be anyone? It doesn't have to be an officer. one specific to men um, so you know maybe we can revisit it later or even after this um, but as a practice it's a it's been a community of what we call action zero 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 so everybody has a stake everybody plays a role in ending gender-based violence um, for and, and towards creating cities and public spaces and even homes or multiple spaces of belonging for everybody um, that's the premise. Um, in terms of access and in terms of, uh, you know, like earlier, I would, I would also invite you to see it as an iterative process where over the past 20 years, I have also, and I'm also still learning to recognize my own identity as non dalit as British, as non-Muslim, right? And I bear that knowledge with responsibility. And that's a commitment, it's a life practice. It's not a project specific um, knowing, it's a conscious, it's, a, it's something to sit with, recognize uh, and take responsibility of, and that's my commitment. And that's something that will um, reveal itself, show itself in the way the project has, and the interventions are designed, in the alliances that are fostered. And that is a, that's a constant pursuit. It's not, uh, and it's something that we're all growing with and learning to recognize and learning to see. And that's also the invitation to anyone who steps in and builds the project together. Um, in terms of uh, spaces, yes, our first call to action was very much about public parks. Um, but as we worked with allies, we recognized that there are many places that do not have parks. So again, if I can say it in Hindi, the call to action changed from sleep in a park to sleep anywhere under open skies. So they are So it it is and the commitment really is about, you know, working towards and having the capacity to work towards building alliances, those could be and like I said, it is really about saying does this idea speak to you, whether you are of you know, which identity are you with and uh, and belong and own. And how does this speak to you? Why does this speak to you? That becomes the inquiry. I've interviewed and uh, you know uh, worked with homeless women who ask questions also around, you know, where do you like to walk alone? Do you go anywhere alone? Um, and so it's not it's not one project specific. It's practice specific, and the inquiry um, is informing and guiding um, everything we do in terms of even leisure or home entertainment. Uh, the fact that uh, homeless women have spoken about sleeping in a hut is to feel safer and they live in the public space, not out of shelter. So, yeah, I hope that's kind of nudge. And I would also say, using the word nudge, I see it all as a nudge, you know, nudge towards self, nudge towards community, nudge towards public conscience. So, yeah. Uh, on the uh, uh, conversation about the people, uh, 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 so I have uh, uh, been always interested uh, in like uh, art in the world of uh, multi-ethnic facilities, and uh, it's uh, I've been admitted in the past seven times. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated by like how uh, uh, how uh, it's built, like uh, like I, uh, one of the pieces that started out like way before my first admission. Uh, in a corner where nobody lives in, uh, has like a has grown uh, like over like the six years, and like like in like the month before, uh, like l last month when I was uh, there for the first time, it it it, it, it 
like occupied like most of the wall and it, it, uh, it so like uh, uh like uh i i, I want to like hear, hear your thoughts and like uh like you do not uh, a, a psychiatric patient is not considered an art like uh like like the like uh uh um like, and yet like i haven't been in a single i've, I've been in four different hospitals i've been in four different hospitals so far and like i haven't been in a single psychiatric ward where like uh where like the walls have not been like so bad like uh, i I want to say Sure what to say, but uh, uh, I think a lot about impermanence when I paint, and that's also a part of the painting process because what we do, what I do in the public space over time, and sometimes I imagine what it is to make a faded painting. The painting that you saw of the woman walking is on an exactly one meter of space. I reduced my mark on that wall. I didn't even want to show off what I could do on a wall. Sometimes just knowing that the wall exists and your thought exists on it is enough. You only guide. And I feel guidance is a good way of coming towards really helping our students or helping their family or leaving gurus. I think everyone should be able to do something on the wall. And there's no claim to do mine on the wall. But you can attempt it in any way. And for me, impermanence becomes the goal. And finally, to make a painting that probably erases itself completely. So I know that answers your question, but uh, yeah. Honestly, like, I, 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 I want every single wall of. Uh, every psychiatric institute to be like uh filled with uh, like you see like uh with, with with specific uh focus on nimhan like uh the a lot of people uh who come to nimhan are, are people who can't uh, go to other places i go to nimhan because i i don't pay for therapy i don't have to pay for therapy uh, like uh like i i, I like like 20, uh, like I, I get, I, I get to see my psychiatrist for 20 days. Like I can't, I, uh, like uh, I'm a transfer who has been kicked out of my family. Like I, I, I can't, I don't have people. So, so um, uh, so, so um, like I, I, especially in these spaces where like uh, uh, uh I, I want every wall to be like uh. I, I, I want complete and utter chaos uh, in the world, like like James, uh, Ben, and like uh, I find the best art inside the in, inside the emergency like uh, inside the emergency room uh, washroom, like uh, like uh, like. I, I I wonder like what would happen if like uh, uh, you know uh, like if 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 the hospital finds someone like drawing they they would like uh, take them out of the ward uh, and like uh, I I imagine what would what would that space run how would that space transform how would like healing uh, 
So much that she gives me is that I do. Um, there's lunch on the terrace again. You can select a cousin once you uh, exit the auditorium and you can pick up again. Can you please be back by 2.15? I know it's a bit tight, but otherwise you run through the